Welcome to episode 116 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for joining me for a little bit of whistling. I'll get to that in a moment. But if you're checking out episode 116 on the YouTube channel or enjoying the content, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, turn on those notifications. Or if you're joining me for this episode on the audio platform, such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications. So that little ditty that I whistled, the track is called Farewell to Cheyenne. And it is another piece of iconic music by the Italian maestro, literally, uh, Ennio Morricone. And this comes from top three for me, all time greatest Western ever made, Once Upon a Time in the West. The seventh film in our continuing series, The Best Movie You've Never Seen. Now, I would say there are a good number of boomers who are big movie fans. Let me preface it. A good number of boomers and Gen Xers and some elder millennials will have seen this movie or parts of it at some point. Because I know that TBS, back in the day, uh, they ran a lot of the spaghetti westerns. Um... And for those who don't know why they're called Spaghetti Westerns, it's more obvious than you think. Sergio Leone, Quentin Tarantino's all-time favorite filmmaker. Oh, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood because it was his way of paying tribute to his favorite filmmaker, Once Upon a Time in the West. And he also made an American film, the Jewish gangster film, which is now incredibly 40 years old, Once Upon a Time in America. There are no coincidences. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, just the title, was another way Quentin Tarantino tipping his cap to his filmmaking idol, Sergio Leone. Once Upon a Time in the West ended up not being the movie that Sergio Leone intended to make. And we've talked about this kind of thing, and movie fans know that things change before a movie gets produced, sometimes during production, there are issues, an actor, an actress. Hell, sometimes even a director gets fired or replaced. Island of Dr. Moreau with Val Kilmer in 1996. Here, Richard Stanley, and then all of a sudden, Richard Stanley gets fired, and here comes John Frankenheimer, and he and Val Kilmer <laughs> almost had a celebrity death match in the middle of the jungle. Sergio Leone, oh, I... I did not even explain to you. See, this is the problem, being a little neurodivergent, when you have so many different thoughts colliding at the same time. It's difficult to keep them in order, or even out of order, but come back to it. Spaghetti Western. It's called that because the movies were supposed to be set in the American West, but they were filmed in Italy. Not Monument Valley, where John Ford and Howard Hawks and guys like that shot so many great westerns like The Searchers and Red River. Fistful of dollars, for a few dollars more, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. What is known as the Dollars Trilogy, Sergio Leone with, at the time, a pretty young Clint Eastwood, who was a TV star here in the United States, went overseas to Italy to shoot a movie called The Magnificent Stranger. Came back home. Well, how was the experience? Well, I mean, it was okay. I, you know, he made a lot of money. The movie's terrible, though. The Magnificent Stranger never got released. Clint Eastwood thought the film was so bad that it had been buried. And several months after he came home, after shooting Magnificent Stranger, I want to say it was 1964. I think it was 64 gets an excited phone call from his agent. Clint, this is um, unbelievable. This is amazing. A fistful of dollars is really tearing up the box office. Big fucking deal. Clint said something to that effect. So what? I don't even know who's in that. Who's in that movie? And what are you talking about? You. What do you mean me? The Western that you shot over there. You mean Magnificent Stranger? Yeah, they retitled it A Fistful of Dollars. It's tearing it up. Lucky break number one in Clint Eastwood's movie career, a film that he thought was so bad it wasn't going to get released. They released under a different title in the United States, and it caught fire, allowing Sergio Leone to make, for a few dollars more, and 
the best film of the three, and a movie that many will argue to this day, the single greatest Western ever made. It's certainly in the conversation, as is Once Upon a Time in the West, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But Sergio Leone, as he was preparing Once Upon a Time in the West, which was going to be released at least a year after The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, if not two years. Let me see if I can get that. Uh, yeah, at least a year. Sergio had a script that he thought was, again, perfect for Clint Eastwood. I don't know if he would have played Man With No Name or whether they would have kept what they ended up doing, whether it would have been seen by some as a continuation of the Dollars Trilogy or a standalone film. Because Clint made another Western on his own in 73, High Plains Drifter, where his character doesn't really have a name either and may be not human. It may be some kind of ghost or vengeful spirit or some cockamamie stuff. I'm not, nobody to this day really knows. That's why I'm saying it that way. So Leone had a script and he worked on it with, um, among others, famous Italian, uh, who became a super famous Italian horror filmmaker, Dario Argento, among others who worked on this script. And I've always liked to see that when somebody who later would become famous for something else, you learn that they worked on a screenplay or part of a production team like Michael Douglas co-produced. Um, he was actually the point man on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest before he became a big movie star. He won an Oscar for producing a movie that was originally going to star his dad, Kirk, and ended up starring, you can't handle the truth. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Jack Nicholson as Randall P. McMurphy. Uh, those quotes are obviously from A Few Good Men, not from <laughs> One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> but I digress, as I often do. James Cameron, for example, was one of the people who wrote the screenplay for Rambo First Blood Part Two. Cameron had already made The Terminator by the time he had submitted that his draft of this, the uh, the Rambo First Blood Part Two screenplay. But I didn't know that he had done that when I, back in film school, 1995, 10 years after Rambo. Now it would be almost 40 years after Rambo. And the credits came on the screen. I said, holy shit. And a lot of us, the buzz was, James Cameron did this? Yeah, don't hold him accountable, though. <laughs> I mean, look, a lot of people love Rambo First Blood Part Two, right? But Clint Eastwood... I don't know that it was that he wanted to move away from the Westerns at that juncture or whether it was more that he was committed. He had other projects lined up, one of which was Coogan's Bluff, which is kind of a Western, but it was a modern day Western in that it starts in Arizona in what appears to be the Old West, but it's set in 1968. And then his character of Walt Coogan ends up chasing a criminal to New York City. His name is Coogan. And there are action sequences in the film that take place in a part of the city that was known as Coogan's Bluff. So the, the title, it was, it was a double entendre. But with Clint Eastwood out of the picture, we only had a problem. Well, who am I going to cast? How am I going to do this? We have this Desperado character that was never going to be Clint. I don't know who's, it, it, by Desperado character, in the world of this movie, he's not a good guy, he's not a bad guy. He's the kind of Chaotic, neutral, lawful, good, maybe, if you go on that scale of good and evil that, um, is it Dungeons and Dragons or World of Warcraft? It's some kind of fantasy thing where they try to explain the scale of hero, you know, absolute hero to absolute villain. So there's a character of a desperado who is kind of, you could sort of say is almost like the man with no name, but not really. And then there's a character known simply as man with a harmonica which is the man with no name character, because if he's known as the man with a harmonica, it means he doesn't have a name. The Desperado's character's name is Cheyenne, hence the whistling that I did, which was a tune that Morricone wrote for this particular character. And then you have the actual bad guy, a ruthless assassin, a gun for hire named Frank. And Leone, without Clint, because he has Clint in his mind already slotted in to play Man with a Harmonica. Well, what is he going to do now? He's going to have to rethink his casting. So he decides to go for broke. The easiest of the three is casting Jason Robards 
as Cheyenne because Jason Robards is an actor who has the kind of face that can easily good guy or bad guy. And Robards, he was, you know, fairly young at the time and he's very, very highly acclaimed actor, worked until well uh, into the 1990s. He's in the movie Magnolia, the Paul Thomas Anderson film. I don't like it. Uh, a lot of people thought it was a masterpiece. Didn't think it was up to the level of Boogie Nights. I didn't even think it was as good as Heart Eight, which was Paul Thomas Anderson, his first, not a big film, but a film that made a serious impression, I would say. Uh, Jason Robards, for perspective, though, if you remember the movie Magnolia, one of Tom Cruise's great supporting performances, uh, he plays Tom Cruise's father in that movie. So this is 30 plus years prior. Robards was a much younger man, and he plays the character of Cheyenne, the kind of desperado outlaw type. Not really a good guy, not really a bad guy. Robards is fucking brilliant in the part. But that left Sergio with, who do we go for for the villain? And who do we go for for the hero? And somebody said, well, you could go with Charles Bronson as the bad guy. Maybe Henry Fonda as the good guy? I mean, Henry's kind of getting up there in age, but what do you think? Sergio Leone presumably a devilish look on his face. He says, I love the idea, but let's flip it. How about we cast Bronson, who played a lot of heavies and was an intimidating, kind of a menacing actor, even in roles where he was not a villain. You go back to The Greatest Escape, The Great Escape, I dig tunnels. The Magnificent Seven, movies like that, where even when Bronson is on the side of the good guys, you keep waiting for him to turn. Had that look. Charles Bronson, Death Wish, one of the greats. So they reached out to Henry Fonda's representatives. This is the story that Henry Fonda himself told on the Mike Douglas show about 1974. It's one of the great Hollywood stories, in my opinion, especially the way Fonda relates it. You can find this on YouTube. To, not so much to check up on me, but this is a phenomenal story. So Fonda... I don't know if he was in particular a fan of Sergio Leone, but the way that he recounts the story is that people told him this guy was marvelous. I think that was the word he used. And if you have an opportunity to work with him, if you're up to it, it might be an arduous shoot in the middle of a fucking desert, or in this case, near the Italian Alps. We don't know what season it was going to be. Go for it. So Henry Fonda asked the question, even if he was only asking the question him, of himself, why would they want to cast me as a nefarious, dastardly Western villain? Is it just because I usually play good guys or what was the methodology? So Fonda had that in mind as he shot the film. And to see the great actor, the great star, the extraordinary talent that was Henry Fonda, who usually, as we say, played humble good guys. 12 Angry Men, to me, is a top 10 great all-time performance from Henry Fonda. With just looks, glances, facial expression, body language, he just commands that film like few others in history have had the ability, especially when going up against home run hitters within the same cast, such as Lee J. Cobb, E.G. Marshall, Hell, Martin Balsam. Fonda is running shit. And not just because of what his character is all about, just the way he stands on screen. He just, he had the magic. So they shoot, they shoot the movie. Very long, as I say, arduous production. And, and from a plot perspective, the movie deals with the building of, uh, I don't know if it was called the Transcontinental Railroad, but the building of the railroads. There's railroad money. There's a lot of really bad stuff that happens in this film. You have a woman who presumably is courtesan, escort, prostitute, whatever you want to, it doesn't matter the phrase. And um, Henry Fonda said he didn't really understand why, even all through filming. But then he's watching the movie for the first time. And he, he knew in his heart that it was going to be at least a good movie. He could tell by the shots and watching the dailies, Leone was even better than he expected. Like this guy is, you know, he's kind of funny and he's cracking a lot of jokes. And he knew that he was in the hands of as great of a filmmaker. And this is a man who worked with John Ford and Hitchcock 
He loved Leone. He loved his style, the, the, the rapid pace. He liked the way he cut. His cutting was very ahead of its time. I should point that out. But Henry Fonda, watching the movie for the first time, he finally understood. Because this is a little bit of spoiler territory. The movie opens with a very terrible scene of mass murder where you have a family father, and I want to say three kids, I'm not sure if it was three or two, but you have this horrible scene where this family, for reasons we don't know, they're beset upon by a gang of bad guys, not even outlaws, they're just bad guys. And we don't see the face of the leader of the group. As the family, this helpless family, look like they're planning a 4th of July barbecue, that's what it looks like they're doing in 18 whatever the year is. Family gets mowed down in brutal, horrible fashion. And there's a little boy standing there trembling. He's just watched his family get massacred. And one of the characters, it may have been the Jack Elam, the famous old actor character. What do you want to do with the boy, Frank? The camera pans up to show Henry Fonda dressed in black with those baby blues, those incredibly blue eyes of his. And with the most flat affectation in his voice, he says, now that he knows my name, boom. And Henry Fonda said, I finally got it. Why they cast me? Because at that moment, when we pan up and we realize that me, that I'm the leader of this band of, of horrible murderers, the entire audience and audiences around the world at the same time said the exact same thing. Jesus Christ, it's Henry Fonda. Jesus Christ, it's Henry Fonda. The movie follows Charles Bronson's Man with a Harmonica as he, at certain points, is tracking down Frank, the Henry Fonda character, and at other times it's the other way around. And then there are still more times where the character of Jill, I think her name is Jill. Yeah, Jill. The character of Jill, who is played by wonderful actress Claudia Cardinal, she's really good in this movie. Um, each of the three men are almost dancing around her. One of them is going to try to protect her. One is going to possess her. And the other is probably going to kill her. So it's that kind of, you know, murder, death, kill, murder, death, kill. Or what is it? Uh, fuck, marry, or die. or I don't even know. I don't remember. It's a game we used to play. I don't remember what it was called. But it's definitely not murder, death, kill. That's from Demolition Man. Um, you have these three guys. The relationship between Man with a Harmonica and Cheyenne is always contentious, but they're not really enemies. And what we get out of Bronson, he has almost no dialogue. The film is, what is it, two and a half hours long? He plays fucking harmonica. He rarely speaks. Rarely speaks. You know, Clint Eastwood, they used to talk about in the Man with No Name uh, movies that he hardly had any dialogue. Clint Eastwood is giving soliloquies soliloquies in the good, the bad, the ugly compared to the amount of dialogue that Charles Bronson has in two and a half hours. But he makes every word count. There's a famous scene near the beginning where the same outlaws that massacred the family, or three of them, square off with Bronson. There's three outlaws, three horses, and Charles. I think it was three, three and Charles. Could have been four. But one of the characters, also, I believe, Jack Elam says, looks like we're short one horse. And Bronson goes, you brought too, too many. You brought too, too many. So his character wants, he wants Frank Fonda dead. But he wants him dead in a very particular way. He doesn't just want him to die. And here is an extraordinary extended action sequence in the middle of this film where Henry Fonda is going to be killed. His character, Frank, is 
outnumbered and there are snipers, he is going to die. The man with the harmonica rescues him. He fucking rescues him. And the character of Jill, as essentially the audience goes, what the hell did you do? You just said you've been talking about for your whole life. You wanted to kill this guy. You just saved his life, asshole. Why did you save his life? And Bronson, again, in maybe the most dialogue, he says at one time in the movie, I just didn't let them kill him. I didn't save his life. I just didn't let those random assholes kill him. That's his code. Yes, he wants the guy dead. But he wants him dead by his gun, by his hand, and he wants him to understand why. Very important. It's not good enough for faceless assassins to bump off Frank. It's got to be me. It's got to be me. And he's got to know why. So the movie progresses on this path where you have a lot of payoffs and switching allegiances. And there are a couple of moments in the movie where it looks like Frank and a man with a harmonica may be reaching a reproachment, but we know well, they're not going to be friends. There's no movie if they're friends. Well, they could both go up against the land baron. That's maybe a movie Tarantino would have made with his uh, propensity for switching allegiances and, okay, we thought this was actually the bad guy, but it's that guy, that kind of thing. There's so many incredible scenes. And any of Morricone's musical score, I would argue, is at least as good here as The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which is top 10 all-time soundtrack. Not even close. It could even be top five. This movie also would slot into the top 10. As far as all-time composers of film music, John Williams makes any top 10 list with anybody who knows and loves music. So does Ennio Morricone. So does James Horner. So does Jerry Goldsmith. So does Bernard Herrmann. But that is how good Ennio Morricone was. He just had, he had magic. He had magic in his fingers and he had magic up here and in here. And so in this movie, it's not as long as The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, which is pushing three hours. And it's certainly not as long as Once Upon a Time in America, Leone's last film. It's unfortunate he wasn't that old. Sergio was in his early 60s when he passed. He's been gone since 1989. Again, we talk about the older filmmakers still working. People such as Coppola, 20 years older than Sergio was when Sergio passed. But Once Upon a Time in America, the full cut is basically four hours long. Four hour Jewish gangster movie. Starts in the World War I era and carries us all the way through the 1960s. But Sergio was not averse to making long movies. But every frame, he made every frame count. And in Once Upon a Time in the West, there is not a wasted shot a wasted beat, a wasted sweaty close-up. There's another guy who was extraordinary with his close-ups. You talk about Kubrick. With Kubrick, the close-ups feel different. With Christopher Nolan, they feel different. I believe Leone was using different lenses, and the current day guys, and even Kubrick, did not do the same kind of framing for close-ups as Sergio. But there are a lot of incredible close-ups in this movie. And you really don't know how it's going to turn out. You assume that, okay, well, Bronson is probably going to get rid of Fonda here. But we don't know about Jason Robard's character. And is the woman going to die? And how is that all going to shake out? Well, I'm not going into spoiler territory. But needless to say, there is not a dull moment in this entire film. And there are these just incredible, epic panoramic shots where even someone like myself, there's no special effects. You ask, how did Leone even set this up? Because there are panoramic shots of, for example, the, the boom towns, they were called, the towns that were going to have the railroads running through, where from a capitalistic perspective, there were a lot of jobs being brought into the area. It's you know, the same as any time. But there are shots in this movie of men working on a railroad, a thriving town, people doing business. And you ask yourself, how do you even shoot something like this? Because nowadays they would be able to green screen and use tricks if an actor didn't quite hit his or her mark. But you see this and say, this movie's 55 plus years old. 
how many takes did, it, did, did he need to get this right? This is just incredible. And it never feels as if Leone is showing off. It never feels as if he's calling attention to the shots. He's simply dropping you into the middle of the story and making you feel the pain of the characters, either psychological, emotional, or in many cases, bleeding out physical. We do get the explanation why the man with the harmonica has been chasing Frank, the man in black, for the entire film, and why it's not, it wasn't okay for someone else to take him out. It had to be him. And as we've also talked about here on the channel, sometimes a role went to a certain performer and history is thankful. Once Upon a Time in the West would have worked with Clint Eastwood as the man with a harmonica and Henry Fonda as Frank, the same other casting, Robards, Claudia Cardinal. But I 100% am convinced that this particular story worked better with Bronson, a more naturally silent actor than Clint. Even though Clint joked about it at the 72 Oscars, you know, when he had to take over, John Wayne got stuck in traffic and they asked Clint to come up and do part of the opening monologue. And he made a joke and everybody thought, he's like, wow, Clint could be funny. Or he said, I don't know why they asked me to come up here. You need me to, to speak. And I haven't had but three lines in my last dozen pictures. And the gallery went crazy. There's a shot of Burt Reynolds falling out of his chair from laughing. He wasn't expecting Clint to be that funny. But once upon a time in the West, I believe that it was fate that Charles Bronson, Henry Fonda, Jason Robards, Claudia Cardinal, that was the cast. It becomes more of a Clint Eastwood film if he's in it. And this particular story didn't need him. It needed the quiet intensity of Bronson in this particular role, as opposed to Clint, because they may have turned it around and said, well, this is now the fourth film in the Dallas trilogy. This movie stands alone. It is by itself, by virtue of the fact that Bronson is in the movie instead of Clint. And Clint never expressed dismay or anything. And Sergio and Don Siegel, his collaborator with Dirty Harry, among many others, those were his two favorite people in the movie business. His two mentors, Sergio and Don, the extraordinary title card at the end of Unforgiven, the last words we see at the end of Clint Eastwood's multiple Oscar-winning masterpiece, 1992, best picture at the Oscars, best director, supporting actor for Gene. I think David Valdez won for production design. That part I'm not sure of. But the last words we see in the credits of Unforgiven for Sergio and Don. There were no hard feelings. Sometimes you're just not meant to do a certain project, even if a director you love wants you to do it. It's the way it goes. Now, Once Upon a Time in the West is available to stream, of course available to rent. But if you get Paramount, uh, and or Showtime, because at least for me, those two channels are bundled on streaming and I only get Paramount, but Showtime comes in. So technically it's streaming on Showtime. You should be able to catch it um, if you get that particular channel. And um, it gets my highest recommendation. It is a top five all-time Western. Everything works. The performances are incredible. The staging of the action sequences you couldn't do it any better today, even with um, higher tech, uh, not even pyrotechnics, but higher tech equipment as far as cranes and dollies and all of that kind of stuff. Everything works. The performances are so good. And Henry Fonda is having so much fun playing the villain, playing a completely unredeemable, horrible excuse for a human being. Just a ruthless, stone cold killer. And he's loving it. He's smiling his way through it. You can just see it in the baby blues as he talks about. He knew he was never going to get a role like this again. And was grateful that Leone decided to go in this direction with this movie. Because he probably wouldn't have cast him if he had gotten Clint, as we talked about. Number seven on our continuing series of the best movie you've never seen, Sergio Leone's 1968 masterpiece, released on the 4th of July, by the way, at least here in the States, Once Upon a Time in the West. If you've caught this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, turn on those notifications. Or if you're 
caught this episode on the audio platform such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, and turn on those notifications. I'll be back with episode 17, uh, yes, I'll be back with episode 117 real, real soon. Till then.